so the greater humanity then, uh, Dickens or Orwell? Yes, the greater humanity must be Dickens, mustn't it? Dickens, definitely. <laughs> well, well, I mean, why? I mean, Orwell's diary, um, which we've just, we've been perfectly broken. Um, no, I, don't, I, think, I think that's a sort of ridiculous kind of thing to say. Orwell um, was, was full of, he wasn't, he wasn't entirely jolly. Why he was so sexy. <laughs> but he was full of um, concerns and decency. I mean, one of the things I think they share, actually, wonderfully, is, uh, is, is that food, good food, in both of them, denotes propriety and decency and, and, and something well rung. I mean, you know, d- d- oh, was an incredibly... Um, th- everybody that came across him was marked, as they were, of course, by Dickens, by the... Extru- he had a kind of human stature that everybody knew... Um, was remarkable, but he was, he was, he gave away most of his money, he was incredibly, he was aloof intellectually, but he was not aloof as a person. He was sort of uptight, but he was, but not as uptight as, as Dickens. I mean, if I could just say, if I could just say, Dickens obviously did like ladies, but, and, 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 and the, 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 lots of them, and, um, but, but, you know, it took Andrew Davis to make you see Esther Summerson as a moral agent, which she is in the book, not as an incredibly irritating wimp that you didn't really want to be part of. I remember as a teenager tr- reading Bleak House, with the most, and I was obviously mistaken. I take it back, I know as well, thinking, I don't want to be Esther. I don't want to be good. Mm-hmm. Can I be bad? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that, I, I think that, I think there are some, I think there are some things that you could say, but, you know, all well stick women are difficult. Uh, I agree in some ways, but I think, I think Dickens women are pretty, you know, between the hag and the, the and, 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 and the rosebud, us um, grown-up women don't have so much territory. No, I really disagree about Esther. I think you were supposed to feel like that about Esther. I think one of the tragic, heartbreaking things about Bleak House is that the only people left alive at the end are the minor characters. And Esther is just one of life's minor characters. Can I just pick on Jean's quotation which was supposed to show how that um, the Orwell actually liked women which is um, Winston making a quip and then she thought this was brilliantly witty and immediately f- flung her arms around him what a statement of male vanity <laughs> really <laughs> you know man makes a joke w- woman goes oh that's so funny let's have sex <laughs> I mean, the kids would I like that happened more often in real life <laughs> yeah but you know, I don't yeah, believe, or well, shit. I don't believe, I don't believe that. I don't, I don't believe that that Dickens Dickens would have been so foolish about as that about um, uh, about women. And I think Dickens' well, women but, but have a huge book, range. But in Jenny's book, I mean, which is brilliant about the Orwell and Dickens, he does have this secret, incredibly intense relationship with these girls. He yeah. absolutely appreciates their love and life. He plunders it hugely yeah. for his writing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. yet, yeah. yes, okay. That's what writers do. Of course they do. But I mean, but he doesn't, he doesn't then ever give you a character that quite has that boldness that he has seen in them. Oh yes, he does. Oh yes, he does. Yes, what about, what about Miss Havisham? What about, um, what about Miss Wade? You, d- you know, I, I, you know, I think even in, um, even in Little Dorrit, there's an incredible bravery there. I think, um, I, I think Bre- Betsy Trotwood is one of the bravest and most admirable women in fiction. I think Dickens never stops. He loves. The- what about, what about? Uh, does anyone know the Mrs. Lirriper stories? Mm. Mrs. Lirriper, uh, the wonderful stories about a small businesswoman in London. Um, just making her way. They are some of the most mm. wonderful insights into into what a woman could do in the 19th century. The 19th century novel has an amazingly few plot options for women on the whole. Um, they get married, they have an affair, they're cast out, and that's about it. You know, not in Dickens. In Dickens, they can start up small businesses and they can start a fight over a donkey on a lawn. Mm. I think this is the difference, in a sense. And if they're old. Between yes, Dickens he loves old women. and he loves Orwell, old women. and there's nothing. Can I just make a defence for loving all women? Because <laughs> men loving women seems to have got a bit of a bad press today. Um, I think it's fine, and I encourage it particularly today. Um, I think Dickens was interested in, in storytelling, and there are few better storytellers. There are few better navigators through the emotion of, of a, a room. I mean, you know. 
great expectation that you are there. You are there, beautifully told. The, the the candlelit darkness that falls away into the corners of the room is beautiful. You're there. Orwell is interested in something more important than merely story, and I think that's evident. In I mean, if you read *The Clergyman's Daughter*, for example, which I think is perhaps one of the lesser read books, but you know that should be every government minister that works for schools ought to read *The Clergyman's Daughter*, in terms of you know it, it, an indictment on an education system. You know the 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 get up and go of Orwell. You know he was he was about immersion in the world he was trying to change. And much as Dickens was involved in the world, he you know I don't think Dickens lay awake at night going, "What social change am I going to action in my next?" I don't I mean, think I think he was I think he was about storytelling. No, if you, you want an indictment the of hall. the if you want an indictment of the education system, you've got to do the boys' hall. You've got hard times. Actually, I think there's the similarities between... I mean, they're both members of the Awkward Squad, which yes. is what Bernard Crick says about, uh, about both of them. And I think it is that radical eye, that radical push that you get from both of them in a way. Yeah. So although they say they don't belong on the same platform, but they do actually belong on the same platform in that sense, that they have got that same... Yeah, that same take on life in a way. I, th I think one of the things you'd say about Orwell, which I think is also as a journey, is that one of the extraordinary things that he does is he changes his mind. Yeah. And he comes, you feel him, and fighting in fighting the Spanish Civil Wars, you know, he starts off as a man of the left, but you get Newtonian and getting on with Anthony Powell and all of those things, but, um, and a sort of a failure, actually, in all sorts of ways. And he stumbles through these not tremendously brilliant novels, but writing huge quantities of incredibly good essays in journalism. And in the Spanish Civil War, unlike everybody else there, in the, unlike Claude Coburn, unlike, you know, all of these people, he, he goes and he fights, and Eileen goes with him, and they have the most extraordinary experiences. Um, somewhere in Russia, there's still his diary in the KGB archive that nobody's oh, wow. seen. It, it's still there. Um, that Eileen had ripped out of her, as it were, by, by, by the communists. But he changes his mind. He doesn't go... It's that really terrifying thing. He, he goes expecting to find one kind of reality, and he cannot resist, because he's all well, in a way that one feels one probably would have done, the true horror of what is happening in the Spanish Civil War, which is that the communists are prepared to kill anybody, um, but not particularly the, the other side. It's their own side that they hate. And you feel him like a very uncomfortable machine, moving around just as you feel him. As you, if you look on our website, in the last three or four weeks before the Second World War breaks out, you find this map. So it's the journey of somebody who changes their mind, changes their politics through very considerable pain, and yet manages to have. And that, I think there is something about that journey. He doesn't always know he's right, and he 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 comes to an apprehension, and he because he doesn't mind. You know, he's an Italian. He doesn't mind disgusting. You know, there's all sorts of sexual hang-ups that may add to that. He doesn't mind the repellent in himself. And he, I think that journey of his writing is what makes it so resonant to now, because we could all go on a journey to be right.